Good evening from Greece, but also good morning and uh, good afternoon since we have attendees that are in different time zones. It's a great pleasure to welcome you all to this webinar entitled Fostering a Mindset of Innovation and Entrepreneurship with Dr. James Hayton, Professor of Innovation and Entrepreneurship at Warwick Business School. My name is Yanis Matsukas. I'm the Executive Director of the Global University Hub here at Metropolitan College of Greece. Metropolitan College is the leading private higher education institution in Greece and the largest transnational education provider in Europe. The Global University Hub, the most recent initiative of Metropolitan College, is the region's largest university hub, home to key global institutions offering diverse academic and professional programs. One of these programs has been designed by Warwick Business School, the UK's top provider of finance and business research and education, and one of the best business schools in Europe. Warwick Business School was founded in 1967. It was the first UK business school to be accredited by the three major business school accreditation agencies, which happened back in 2001. As the largest department of University of Warwick, they offer both excellent facilities and a prestigious reputation to students who come from around 120 countries to study at undergraduate, masters, MBA and PhD levels. The school also has a presence in London at the South, the tallest building in Europe for both teaching and networking events. Professor Hayton is Pro Dean for External Affairs at WBS. Uh, James specialized in corporate entrepreneurship, the factors that make an organization innovate or sometimes not. Uh, I remember him describing this in one of his interviews as the difference between IBM successfully switching from computing to consultancy and Kodak failing to embrace digital photography. So work has always been viewed as entrepreneurial and obviously WBS, Work Business School, falls into the innovator category thanks to its core values of curiosity, openness, restlessness and excellence. We're very happy to have Professor Hayton with us today to explore the secrets of how to achieve true innovation through entrepreneurship and what are the key ingredients that foster an innovation mindset and how the world's most innovative companies fast track innovation. Thank you for joining us, James. Thank you very much for having me. Um, I think this is a very interesting topic. Uh, obviously, it's it's something that I've focused my research and uh, and practical work on for a number of years now, and also teach it across a number of programs here at, at, at WBS. Uh, I have the pleasure of overseeing what we do in the Shard, which I think of as, as quite an entrepreneurial venture in and of itself. Um, we're watching the challenges of entrepreneurship unfolding before our eyes today. Um, just in the last couple of weeks, we've seen Microsoft announcing significant investments in chat GPT, uh, open, um, uh, the um, uh, open AI product, um, and incorporating it into its own products with some mixed success. Uh, but what's very interesting actually is the fact that uh, a company uh, that created some of the foundational technologies, the uh, large language models and generative uh, AI uh, to, to create value. And there's, there's lots to unpick in this story, uh, which I think relates to why this is so interesting. Uh, Microsoft, over the last decade, has undergone a transformation and it's no coincidence that that, uh, that came at a time when it got new leadership. And that new leadership uh, then has created an entirely new culture at Microsoft relative to its, its predecessors. Um, and it's a culture of learning. And it's a culture of exploring and taking small risks and, and experimenting and learning from those risks uh, in ways that Microsoft didn't do before. And as a result, they've managed to really significantly advance their product portfolio and also made this, this significant leap into, into generative AI. At the same time, we see what's happening at Google, where for a number of reasons we can, we can expect, one is 
they may be worried that uh, generative AI will cannibalize their existing products. And so they suffer from that classic innovators dilemma uh, that we see or we saw at uh, Kodak 40 years ago when they created the digital camera technology but didn't want to exploit it. And this is this is a perennial problem for established organizations that there's a desire to protect their current position and serve their existing customers. And new new opportunities often either look very risky or perhaps unattractive or, or even threaten their existing business model. And that's what we may see with the generative AI and, and Google story. So what's interesting, lots of things in here, but 40, 50 years on, we're still companies are still making the same missteps uh, and, and facing the same fundamental challenges over and over again. Uh, and I think it's um, we, we often think of entrepreneurship being uh, being uh, about individual startups, but so much of economic development comes from entrepreneurship by established organizations. Uh, the reason why Fuji was able to thrive while Kodak failed was through its entrepreneurial ambitions. And, and those stem from leadership first, but leadership followed by process, followed by culture. There's lots of components here to, for organizations to manage. So it's certainly not going to be a silver bullet. Um, but we know a lot about it now. And uh, that's what I'm fascinated by and, uh, and what I teach. And, and we've structured the course around this this phenomenon. It's, uh, yeah, it's very, very interesting. and. Obviously, we're very we're very happy to to have this particular course in Greece. I'm sure that is going to have a, a significant contribution in the sector. So, um, about the value, about the importance of innovation in business. So, it, it allows adaptability. It fosters growth. It separates businesses from their competition. So, how we train executives? This. So, it seems that most of the executives, most of the CEOs, were not you know. Well, they got their degrees long, long, long time ago, and it seems that innovation and entrepreneurship it was it wasn't part of the curriculum. So, how we train executives innovation today? So, my approach to this is to try to talk about uh, innovation and corporate entrepreneurship as a as a system um, where leaders have to of course understand their role in in the process and and what obstacles they may face as individuals um but also understanding um okay how what what are the the obstacles and facilitators in an organizational culture and how can you impact that aspect of the organization and then also how can you design uh, processes that fit your own organization's context to enable it to create or, or identify interesting opportunities and then uh, reduce the risk in exploring those opportunities uh, so that you you fail early uh, to identify the, the most successful or the most beneficial opportunities and then you have tools for developing and embedding them within the organization. So I, I always think about this as, if we're trying to understand innovation, we have to look at these three things. We have to look at the, the, um, the, the strategy and structure of the organization. We have to look at the processes, and then we have to look at the leadership and culture. And those, there's not one priority there. All three have to be put in place uh, and understood to be mutually reinforcing. Uh, so my module here takes that approach of trying to understand how to diagnose the organization to, to, to choose an appropriate strategy and structure with those simulations and, and looking at case studies um, and also having tools to diagnose the internal environment and to see, okay, do we have enough leadership support? Do we have the resources we need? Are we ready? recognizing innovative contribution so having some diagnostic tools to help look at your own organization setting and i find all of those things combined tend to bring a greater appreciation for and actually a set of, of 
tangible tools you can use the next day. Uh, and I often get feedback from people who've gone through these modules saying, this helped us to start a new venture within our business, or this helped us to reorient our culture to become more, more agile and, and entrepreneurial. Um, so I think it's bringing, bringing um, past experience and some, some frameworks to the practical problems that every organization faces. And don't, don't be mistaken, every organization is different. So we've got the frameworks and then it's the executives who have to deploy those within their own contexts and, and, and shape them to fit their own contexts. But I think um, you train executives by giving them the conceptual tools and letting them together with, with peers often in the classroom uh, or in the workplace, understand how they could uh, employ those frameworks and hopefully move move the dial and make their organizations more innovative and entrepreneurial yeah nice nice approach to zooming in on the company on the the main structure if we try to zoom out and because you you, you spoke about the ecosystem about the support about the tools that are available um, and let's see, for example, see the, the startup or a company, part of the massive, of the huge ecosystem. Many entrepreneurs question the role, for example, of their local government in their startup ecosystem. Does government impact entrepreneurs in a positive way by fueling creativity? Or does it hinder the innovation of startups by offering too many barriers of entry? I'm saying about barriers because I'm talking about Greece now. So how we can support local startup ecosystems and unlock new collaborations for innovation? Well, that's an interesting question for sure. I mean, the I guess government can and bureaucracy can can either help or hinder. I mean, we see the most entrepreneurial um, nations are the ones that minimize the speed to start up through take, breaking down the red tape. Um, and, and so that's absolutely essential. But the government can also stimulate or support entrepreneurship by supporting, uh, both supporting basic research often in universities, but also supporting the connection that entrepreneurs can make with universities or other, other organizations to access knowledge and providing uh, grant funding for those early stage ventures, seed money for those early stage, ven stage ventures to explore um, potentially valuable opportunities that could be socially beneficial. Um, and I, I think we see that uh, in a number of nations where uh, the governments or government agencies are providing uh, basic grant level grant support uh, for early stage ventures, creating uh, incubator spaces and programs and growth accelerator programs, uh, low cost loans and so on, um, and, and encouraging business education. Because I think one of the things that we find is um, actually having the, the, the knowledge and skills that people have are a really critical component in the process. Uh, it doesn't necessarily need to be a formal degree, uh, of course, I mean, but, but accessing the, the know-how uh, is a real critical component in, in addition to having that, that novel and, and potentially valuable business idea. Um, and so supporting not just the, the knowledge exchange processes, but also the, the skill building processes uh, and perhaps hopefully reducing the the cost of the early stage of startup in terms of bureaucracy, time, and money, um, government can play a significant role. Yeah, interesting. You mentioned earlier about these tools. Uh, you mentioned you mentioned these two large companies in the start. With uh, with all this rapid technological advancement of uh, of the recent years, it seems that computers are increasingly encroaching on domains that um, were previously considered exclusively human. So nearly every day it brings news of remarkable feats, you know, from Microsoft, uh, Google or other companies achieved by computers or robots, for example. And mm -hmm. we then ignore the question, will all these 
technological aspect, techno tools, machines, edge us out of brain jobs. How, how we can take advantage of these technologies, the artificial intelligence, robotization, so that they lead to better jobs rather than more unemployment? Yes, that's well, that's a, a subject that's close to my heart. And uh, we have a, a grant funded project on exactly this topic. Um, I mean, the the, the the headlines in the last few years have been about this threat and they they sort of st they came from a a, a study t about 10 years ago now that suggested half the jobs in the US economy were at threat of disruption from uh, from new digital technologies artificial intelligence and robotics um, those those threats have been the the numbers have changed over time and we have to distinguish between the the potential for disrupting work and the actual disruption of work. That's the first thing. So while yes, potentially the number of tasks can be replaced by artificial intelligence and, and robotic automation, in practice, particularly SMEs, but all firms don't tend to adopt universally these technologies. Um, so they tend to be adopted more quickly by large firms, or by greenfield startups, uh, but it's harder for SMEs and, and uh, existing businesses to, to incorporate the new technologies into their, their work processes. So that's slowing down that threat. One part of the, the challenge of adoption is that it's leading to a, a polarization in the labor market. So it's creating more work for the highly skilled, but it's also de-skilling the middle level of the labor market so there's people getting pushed to lower skilled and therefore lower paid work as well so it's causing economic inequality when where it's happening and so we we see that as a general long term trend in in the economy but for individual organizations making the adoption decision it's quite interesting because we're also seeing evidence that the the different different uh, employment relationships will impact whether or not the the technology is adopted to augment work or to substitute for work and so where we have organizations with with strong relationships with their employees that are making investments in their employees that see their competitive advantage residing in their employees They'll make investments in technology, but those investments will enhance the work. They'll augment the work of, of their employees, or they'll take away the dangerous, dirty, and dull parts of the job, and they'll get to do the more interesting things, like develop customers and develop ideas. Um, so you see a more constructive application of technology where there's a philosophy of investing in your people. So there's a lot of nuances in terms of how technology is being adopted the the other side of this is very interesting which is even as i think you mentioned in your question that you've got you've got highly skilled knowledge based creative work that's now potentially being disrupted by generative artificial intelligence so things like market research where or or even venture capital, where you're having to do analyses and then write reports very, very regularly and frequently, that's highly skilled professional work that is already being disrupted, replaced by AI. Now, to get the output from AI, you still have to have the knowledge. Somebody has to engineer the prompts to AI to get the result. And I think what happens here is what we saw in manufacturing automation in the 1950s and 60s, which is Actually, what happened with manufacturing automation is it expanded the demand for manufactured products because they were made more cheaply. Uh, and consequently, global manufacturing employment expanded. So there's a reason to expect the same kind of thing happens with, with global um, knowledge work employment where we we work alongside the artificial intelligence and we learn how to to leverage it and we create these knowledge products at a significantly lower cost increasing the demand and, and use of those those products and and therefore raising the raising all boats with that with that rising tide i think we don't know for sure 
uh, until it happens. But the, the evidence seems to be that new technologies do change work and change jobs, but they also increase demand for new new products and, and new technologies. And so that leads to a, an expansion in the global economy. Uh, the threat has been always that it shifts, you know, so in the 50 years ago, we were shifting industrial employment away in the UK uh, towards service. And we, we have regions of the country that then uh, are left behind. And you, you see that around the world. The same thing happens with offshoring of manufacturing. Um, we, we've seen movement of that kind of work around the world. And we will probably see the same kind of thing with knowledge work. So bringing it back to our, our purpose today, it's how do we build our organizations so that they can be robust to these changing tides, these changing environments, uh, so that you can move from manufacturing to service, service to consulting, consulting to knowledge creation, uh, and, and you can find those new opportunities based off, off of your existing expertise so that your organization lives for 100 years and thrives rather than getting turned over by these these dramatic new waves of, of technology. Yeah, and that that leads to, to the last question, because innovation has, has uh, both technological and non-technological aspects. And many times mm -hmm. it needs to be complemented by the other for one to work. What's the role of non-technological innovation, such as new business models and marketing innovations in a firm's business development and success in the future. So that's so technological innovation or improving your existing processes or products with, with uh, you know, new components or new ways of manufacturing or, or new ways of producing a service. Um, that's relatively easy for organizations to swallow right to adapt to over time you incrementally change the organization and it doesn't change necessarily fundamentally how you work and importantly it doesn't change who your customers are or how you access your customers business model innovation is often the, the more disruptive for organizations and it's 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 hard because you're you might be looking at new markets or markets that more importantly markets that don't yet exist that have to be developed. Um, and those can be the ones that tend to disrupt the incumbents much more uh, than the, the technological, the slow technological change. So the ability to explore and see potential new markets and then to develop those markets is something that, that existing organizations find very hard to do because of what we call the innovator's dilemma your profit your importance comes from serving your existing customers um, your whole organization is built around serving those existing customers using your existing business model so this means there's lots of inertia that, that makes it hard to change your your existing operating leadership will not want to give resource away to explore things that are Make, going to make a loss or that are highly risky and so on that when they could make more money from serving the existing customer so that that leads you to be blinkered towards that existing customer just as kodak was in the 1970s and 80s saying that that the you know there's no market for digital technology digital photography so we shouldn't waste any time exploring that but what happens is then you're you're blinkered to those opportunities they grow they become they become something or some of them become something and all of a sudden your competitors or often new entrants have come in and developed those opportunities and established a beachhead uh, that you find very hard to pursue so you're right to point out i mean it's the business model innovation um, where you're looking at again either new markets or even more importantly where there's no market and you have to create that uh, you can you can fall slightly behind and then surge ahead on on the increments. You know you're making uh, phones. Okay, your your phone gets your competitors got a bigger phone before you did, or one more camera before you did. Uh, you can catch up with that. That's not fatal. 
But what's fatal is if you miss whatever the wearable is that follows on from phones, if you don't explore those opportunities, then all of a sudden a new unheard of business comes up and, and destroys it. Just as, just as Apple did to Nokia, right? Apple wasn't in the phone business, uh, completely wiped. Uh, for phones so uh yeah that's that's really to me the most interesting of all of the challenges is how you avoid that kind of disruption yeah excellent i think that that's uh, the last example was was very was very strong in the uh, the point uh, i think that's that's a nice way to conclude the uh, the webinar it has been an extremely informative and we're very happy for giving us james a flavor of what does entrepreneurial and innovative mindset require. So in closing, um, on behalf of Metropolitan College and the Global University Hub, I would like to thank you for your time. I know you have a very busy schedule uh, and we look forward to welcome you in Athens very, very soon. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Yanis. It was a pleasure. I look forward to seeing you. Yeah.